Then there was a specific variation that we did which was called the linear variation method and I will also remind you of that because that was very interesting. So on the subject of variation, this may not be required immediately, but it will be required at some point of time. So the three is linear variation. So I will first tell what is linear variation, okay. So linear variation is the following kind that I actually choose my psi tilde, it is no longer arbitrary. I choose my psi tilde as a linear combination of some basis functions, some basis functions. So let us call some uh, C i, okay. Now that C i do not confuse with this C i, okay, obviously. Some basis function C i times chi i. Do not confuse these chi i's with spin orbitals. They are the basis for n particle function, n electron problems. So these are n, n electron problems. So I write my psi tilde as a linear combination of this chi i, where chi i's are known basis functions. So what are my trial parameters? C i tilde. So basically what I am doing, I am changing this ci tilde in a known basis and generating different psi tilde and then seeing what happens. Obviously if my basis is complete, which means it is an infinite dimensional basis, then I go back to the theorem 1, Euler variation, which means I actually get exact solutions. Remember the Euler variation, the exact solution. I have already discussed such a case when these are determinants, full CI. So if I have an infinite basis and take all determinants, okay, then I will get exact solutions, which I already told you, full CI, which will give you exact wave function and here I will get, depending on the coefficients, all exact solutions, okay. Just for, just that you do not get confused with this chi, probably I should use a different determinant some di, okay, just to show that they are determinants. So these di's are nothing but a determinants generated out of chi. This can be one, one example generated out of the one particle basis. Which is my chi's? It can be, this is an example, but it need not be. It can be any basis. But I am just trying to tell you that in case this is complete, then quite obviously I do not have to go through whatever I am telling you. You can directly go to the theorem 1, Euler variation, because then I am scanning psi tilde over the entire Hilbert space, because my di's form the entire space and then quite obviously all stationarities of psi tilde h psi tilde will be one of the eigen solutions of h, which I actually mentioned without proof for the theorem 1. What is interesting of course is not that, what is interesting is that what happens when I do not vary over the entire Hilbert space, just like I did here a proof, what happens? Clearly theorem 2 would exist then, that whatever happens, this quantity would certainly be equal to E0, right, greater than or equal to E0. Again, assume psi tilde, psi tilde is 1. In many of the cases for proof, we will always assume the normalization, so do not worry. So theorem 2 will obviously hold good, because that is greater than 1. Theorem 1 will hold good only if it is complete. Theorem 2 will always hold good. In case of complete, it will become equal to, otherwise of course it will become greater than the exact ground state uh, energy. So then this is certainly holds good. Why am I? Talking of linear variation then, if it is just a, to tell you, highlight you theorem 1 and 2, no. There are certain more interesting results that we may get when we have a variation involving such basis, such linear combination of basis and that is what I will first state. Again without proof, I will first state. If you do this calculation of psi tilde A psi tilde. Okay, assuming that again it is normalized and, and do a stationary calculation. 
So, you analyze the stationarities of site in the H site, okay. If you do that, then if this is a m dimensional basis or let us say k dimensional basis, okay, then first of all what I will get is that I will get k solutions. You will actually get an equation which I will show you later is a matrix equation in k dimensional space. In fact, right away you can now see that the configuration interaction that I discussed can be easily done using this for an incomplete set of determinants. That is if I do not take all MCN, I take a few of them, then exactly this is going to hold good for configuration interaction because, because it is an incomplete set. So, if I have k number of determinants or k number of bases, again when I am saying determinants is an example, it can be any basis, then this will give me k solutions. That is very important first to know how it will come to k solution, I will show later. k solutions and let me order those k solutions as E0, 0 tilde, E1 tilde, E2 tilde, etc., where this is less than equal to this. These are as far as the solutions are concerned. Remember, they are not exact solutions now because I have a k dimensional subspace, so they cannot be exact solution, correct. So, they are they are they are not, of course, exact solution, yet each of them must be greater than or equal to E naught. That is also clear from the realities. Is it clear? Because theorem 2, of course, holds in this case. So, I order the solutions that I get out of the linear variation in this manner. What is interesting? to note in this case is that obviously this E naught tilde which is the lowest among the solutions is going to be greater than E naught and, and all others are also going to be greater than equal to E naught which is needless to say. But what is more interesting is that the second solution E 1 tilde is also going to be greater than equal to E 1 and in fact if I go forward E 2 tilde will be greater than equal to E 2 and so on. So, all the finally the E k tilde would be greater than equal to E k. This is remarkable because now we are not talking of just greater than equal to E naught. Of course, if something is greater than equal to E 1 or E 2 or E k, it must be greater than equal to E naught. That is needless to say because E naught is the lowest. But now we are saying how much greater that the second solution must actually be so much greater that it must be greater than the first excited state energy. The third one must be greater than E2. This is remarkable because now for the first time this bound that I said for E0 can now be changed to saying that I have an upper bound property for each of these E0, E1, E2, E3. Because many times in chemistry we are interested in excited states. So far my bound property was only for ground state and now remarkably in the linear variation, I have an upper bound property for excited states. So, this is a very, very interesting problem. Again, this problem was I had given that paper, I do not know how many of you have read this paper of McDonald, sorry, Physical Review 1933. I do not remember the volume and page number, but you should be able to find out. It is a very, very nice paper by McDonald, and actually, this was expanded later by Heilerus and Undheim. And what I am going to talk is now called Heilerus. I hope all of you know Heilerus' name, yeah. Heilerus Undheim McDonald theorem. Okay, that is the theorem that I am going to state. This is a part of the theorem. There are some parts of the theorem. So, the first part is that each of the solution is greater than its corresponding corresponding exact solution exact solution. These are exact solution, the tildes are variational solution. So, I am using tilde for trial function as well as variationally optimized function. This is after variation. So, from here I do a stationarity that is important. Only after stationarity whatever I get, they must all be greater than or equal to its corresponding exact solutions. Is it clear this part? So, this is of course, much more powerful than just the Rayleigh statement because Rayleigh statement only talks about great being greater than equal to E naught, it does not say what solutions will be greater than equal to E 1 or E 2. So, here I can get the solutions, I will let you know how to get the solution, this k solutions, uh, this is basically some matrix eigenvalue problem, 
but if you solve these, then whatever you get by stationarity, uh, stationarity essentially means you expand the psi tilde in this uh, basis and make this C i tilde is stationary as the first order change of this becomes 0. So, that is always the meaning of stationarity, right? First order change is 0. Do that calculus, you will get some results, and this is what you will get. Yes. That is that part is there that I have not said no. Well, it, it this part is correct. That, that I am going to come next because this part does not say this, this part just says that they are each of them is greater than equal to this corresponding state. So, that is the next statement, okay. That depends on how many states you have taken and so on, okay. The, the part that he already mentioned is something that I am going to now talk about. Let me start from this k dimensional basis and then add one more basis. So, let me change the basis to k to k plus 1. I hope you understand the problem. So, I my, my trial function now becomes i equal to whatever 0 to yeah actually yeah the solutions I mentioned 0 I have made 1, but I think you understand what it means. So, if I have to write then this should be actually k minus 1 to be more correct because it is a k dimensional. So, please make that correction. It cannot have E0 to Ek. That will become k plus 1. Okay, I hope you understand that. That is fine. So, I have now added one more basis. So, my functions now become k plus 1 dimensional and I will now get E0 tilde, E1 tilde, etc. up to Ek tilde. Now, truly I will get up to Ek tilde. That is my k plus 1. Again, I ordered them in the same manner that this is less than equal to this, etc. E2 tilde and so on. What is interesting in this part of the theorem is uh, before I do that, let me just for uh, sake of uh, clarity say that I must distinguish this E0 tilde with this E0 tilde because obviously they are different. So, let me call this E0 tilde k plus 1, E1 tilde k plus 1 and so on. Okay. Then the theorem, this part of the theorem first says that the E0 tilde k plus 1 is always less than or equal to E naught tilde k. So, in a k plus 1 dimensional basis, the corresponding solution that I am going to get after stationarity will be always less than or equal to E naught tilde with the previous basis. So, adding a basis only lowers the energy. And you already know from the theorem 2, Rayleigh's variation principle lowering the energy is very good because it is bringing me closer and closer to the ground state. Now, I know from here lowering the energy is very good for other states also because each of them is an upper bound. So, each of them is coming very nicely closer and closer to its own excited states, to its own state energies, right and so on. So, I hope this part is clear that, but please remember when I compare this, this is an addition of one function. If you compare with a k dimensional basis, with another arbitrary k plus 1 dimensional basis, this is no longer true. This, this means that I must take this basis and only add one more. I cannot change that basis, then only the theorem is true. So, if I add one more function, then all the numbers will become, will decrease. All the numbers will decrease compared to the previous number, but interestingly, they will all be an upper bound. So, they will never cross. So, what does this together mean? So, this is my E0. Let me just do a simple calculation. This is my E1, this is my E2, okay, and this is my E3. Let us say initially, I do a three dimensional calculation, okay. So, I will get my E0 tilde somewhere here. I will have to get a E1 tilde which must be higher than this somewhere here. So, this is my three, di three dimensional, uh, this is my, okay, three dimensional basis. I have total four solutions and then I will get E2 tilde 
which will be higher than here, but not necessarily here. Now that I do not have a fourth solution, this can go anywhere, okay, this can go anywhere, but when it stops here, I do not care whether E2, 3 is here, in between E2, E3 or here, it has to be only greater than E2, right. However, let me, let me add one more basis to this. Uh, let me add one more basis to this, then I will have my E naught tilde 4 here, which must low, lower, this must also be lower and of course, it cannot cross. This also must, this whatever, wherever this E 2 tilde 3 will now also low, will actually come down and this will come in between. What is interesting is it will come in between E 2 and E 3 and somewhere here will go to this. So, this is 4. Uh, this is 3, of course, this is E2 tilde 4, okay, and this will become E3 tilde 4. Again, it can go anywhere. This structure was ensured by a very interesting theorem that McDonald proposed in that paper, and that is called the separation theorem. It says that between every two roots, Roots means solutions. Solutions to this problem, variational problem lies one and only one exact solution. This statement is beautiful actually. It now means that when I do 4, E2 tilde 4 cannot be here. Initially, I said E2 tilde 3 can be anywhere. It cannot be here because between these two roots, there must lie one root, right. So, once I do that, the last one can be anywhere. But moment I put another solution, that one will come down. So, between these two roots, E0 tilde, E1 tilde, there is one root here. Between these, there is one root, one exact solution. Between these, there must be an exact solution. So, this must not cross E3. I hope you understand. When I do a four-dimensional basis, this cannot cross E3, exact E3, E2 tilde 4. So, this must be below because in between there must be a root, must be an exact solution. The root is, uh, root is of course, the solution after the variational problem. So, lies one and only one exact solution, sorry, only one. This is actually the content of the theorem, which essentially says that nothing can cross its own root, because if it crosses, then also this theorem won't be, will be violated, because then between the two roots, there will be no root. So essentially, the variation method that I stated is actually a consequence of the separation theorem. What McDonald did was actually to prove this theorem. Many times, this is called interleaving theorem. Many, many places you might have it. Interleaving means essentially you understand what is interleaving. There are two leaves and in between there is one exact solution. So, it is an interleaving theorem or separation theorem and this actually comes directly from here. So, for example, I go to a simple two root problem. So, in a two basis, so I have E0, I have E1. So, just to show. So, this is of course E0 tilde 2 two basis problem. So, this will be greater, it will be somewhere and then there will be E1 tilde. The point is there must be one root between them. So, that is the reason if this is between E1 and E0, that is all you have to ensure, then of course, the E1 must come here. So, then this automatically becomes an upper bound E1. And then if I increase the basis, the next one will be automatically upper bound E2. So, the upper bound property that I, that I actually explained is a consequence of the separation theorem, okay. And that is, that is very most important thing. And obviously, when you add one more solution, they will also go down. There is no other option. So, if you look at both these theorems were actually put together in this content uh, as a content of this interleaving theorem or the separation theorem. And this is what McDonald has proved. This is basically a mathematical proof 
because essentially this solution come out, as I said of an eigenvalue equation of a matrix, k by k matrix. So, he only analyzed mathematically how these eigenvalues of a k by k matrix remain. That is nothing to do with quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry. Remember, this is mathematics. Eventually, this will be an eigenvalue problem which I will show. So, it is only analysis of the eigenvalues of an eigenvalue problem that if I keep on increasing the basis of an eigenvalue problem, how does the eigenvalue, how do the eigenvalues change? So, it is actually can be applied to mathematics, physics, engineering, biology. In fact, engineering people have applied a long, long, long back. But it is very interesting that this application immediately after McDonald's thing came, almost immediately came to quantum chemistry, very fast. Because the quantum chemistry was developing and in particular, of course, you can imagine for this problem of linear variation, which is basically configuration interaction. I already told you that if I make a linear combination of a determinant, then I have a configuration interaction. So, to the CI problem, this will be actually used. And I, I have not told you, of course, how to get the CI tilde, neither in the context of CI nor here, but that will be the matrix eigenvalue problem, which I just promise I will come to that very quickly. So, so that essentially is the content of the linear variation method and as you can see, it is a very powerful method because if I do an arbitrary variation of Rayleigh Ritz, I really do not know where I stand. But here, I have a lot, lot more idea of where I stand. I also know that this solution cannot exceed this. It must be because there has to be a separation interleaving one root. So, that is a very one, one exact solution. So, that is why the linear variation is a very powerful method in quantum chemistry. Again, lot of problems linear variation is used. For example, the particle in a box, just now I gave an example, C m n x to the power m x minus l to the power n, that is a linear variation problem, please understand, except, except that the basis is not normalized. Please remember, my basis is normalized. I, I have to again mention here. So, it will not be an exact eigenvalue equation there. There will be a some kind of a change, but basically it is not very difficult to renormalize. You can always go to a renormalized basis, which is orthonormalized from there and then do the problem. So, if they are normalized, then the solutions come out very nicely and this will be the content of how to get the solutions in any of the linear variation. And I will, I will just show, I have 5 or 10 minutes, I will actually show that how this, this case solutions turn out to be an eigenvalue equation, so that I complete this part of the variation method, okay. I think I am not going to discuss too much about variation method because next class I want to go into the actual Hartree-Fock, Hartree-Fock method, okay, Hartree-Fock theory, all right. So, I come back to this linear variation very quickly and tell you now how to get the solutions and because I have been talking of the matrix, matrix, matrix. So, we must know. So, what do we do? A simple way, so basically what we want to do is to find out such, find out uh, the, the average value of psi tilde a psi tilde, the first order change should be equal to 0. So, that is basically the, the content of the variation method. So, I must put this here on psi tilde on this side, psi tilde on this side and make them equal to 0. To do that, of course, I must ensure that the di's are normalized, okay. So, if I do this, let us write down the Lagrangian which I am subject to this condition. So, what will be the actual um, statement that this minus some ij lambda ij di dj minus delta ij, right. So, this is what is called the Lagrange variation. I hope all of you know this is the variation under constraint. So, I am varying this under the condition that d i d j minus delta j should be 0. I think I have done this many times. So, this is what I am actually going to vary. So, I am going to vary the c i tilde is not sorry. Yeah, I can keep it keep it like this. I am going to vary the c i tilde is such that this quantity becomes the first order change is 0. So, it, let, let us do it very quickly, how the first order change becomes 0. So, let us expand the psi tilde a psi tilde. I had already done this expansion once in proving the Rayleigh's variation principle. So, it is the same thing sum over i j c i tilde star or yeah whatever c j d i h d. Note that 
that time I had expanded in terms of exact eigenfunctions for proving the Rayleigh Hills principle. Here it is not an exact eigenfunction, they are basically the basis. So, this is what I will get here. I expanded this as i, this as uh, j. So, I get di h dj minus sum over ij lambda ij di dj yeah actually uh, this is not right yeah. actually this is not right di dj are anyway orthonormal it is a ci square sorry mod ci square minus 1 that is equal to 0 okay so it should be ci star ci minus 1 into lambda i j okay because obviously i told you that if these are orthonormal essentially the condition is that this must be square of this must be equal to 1 okay so ci ci star ci all right so now what i do i vary ci star first order variation and then find out what is the change or i can actually differentiate this expression as ci tilde star either way it is okay. So, if I do this, this differentiation, uh, again of course, if I put this then there is only one condition I do not need to write lambda ij, I can simply write this, sorry, there is a mistake here in the very first place. So, I can simply write as a lambda because there is only one condition mod ci square equal to 1. So, there is only one Lagrange parameter, okay. So, now if I vary with respect to ci star, what will you get? You will get cj times di h dj. Note what I am doing is this is my Lagrangian. I am varying this Lagrangian with respect to delta ci star. Either delta ci star or delta ci, does not matter, only one of them. So, you have a sum over j cj di h dj minus lambda times this is sum over i, okay. This is sum over i lambda times ci equal to 0. It is very easy to do this because lambda time 1 will not contribute anything. When I do ci star ci, one of the summation is ci. So, I, I differentiate only ci will remain. Here there is a double summation. So, when I differentiate ci star cj will remain with a single summation. So, the entire thing will now become di h dj times cj sum over j equal to lambda times ci for all i because I have to differentiate for all i, okay. So, I am sorry for this uh, little mistake here on the con constraint. So, that is why there is a little confusion. There is a sum over i ci star ci minus 1. So, that is and there is only one condition. So, I need only one parameter. This obviously as all of you can recognize is a matrix eigenvalue equation. You construct this element matrix element and call these are numbers right. So, call this as a matrix. So, you arrange them in the row i column j. So, it is a two dimensional matrix because when I integrate this basis Hamiltonian with this basis d i star d j I will get number for each i j. So, eventually this is a matrix equation. So, it is a d let us say h i j or whatever I call it c j equal to lambda c i. So, let us call this matrix as a h i j. So, this will then become sum over j h i j c j equal to lambda c i and all of you know that this is basically a matrix eigenvalue equation. So, that is a matrix, this is the column of c's which I am trying to find out, this is the column of c's that I am trying to find out equal to the eigenvalue times one number and this is for all i. So, obviously, I am going to generate the full set and then you have to solve this equation. So, this is how you actually get this k solutions. Obviously, if I have a k by k matrix, how many eigenvalues are there? k eigenvalues. Again, all of you know from the mathematics. So, if I have a k by k solution, I get k number of lambdas. I have written this equation for one lambda, but you have actually k number of lambdas and eventually these coefficients can become a square matrix and I can write a different form and I have shown this also how to write matrix eigenvalue. See, matrix eigenvalue equation is very important. Huh? Please read it, revise it. So, one of the revision point those who are revising must be matrix eigenvalue equation properly. Uh, we have done this very thoroughly. If you do not understand matrix eigenvalue equation, it is very hard. It will keep coming in quantum chemistry in different forms, okay. So, the CI problem that we have been discussing which is basically linear variation is nothing but 
solution finally at the matrix eigenvalue phase. All you need to do is to calculate these matrix elements. The matrix element of the physical Hamiltonian in the basis, whatever is my basis, okay, and then diagonalize that matrix, okay. So that is basic recipe to get all the solutions and, and this particular way of writing the way I wrote here, uh, expanding psi tilde and psi tilde left, right like this is something that I showed for Allerith's principle, but there of course these were exact eigen solutions. That is a formal basis, formal expansion to show that uh, the, the upper bound theorem with respect to E0. Here it is a basis, so of course these numbers have to be computed. These are not the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. Please remember, I again repeat, many people get confused. These are any basis. So obviously the, if these are not eigenfunctions. If these are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, I would not do this. My Ds are already eigenfunctions, right? So I expanded that time psi tilde in terms of eigenfunction only to show the upper bound principle. Of course, I do not know the eigenfunctions. So these are some basis in which you calculate this matrix element and then solve an eigenvalue first. And then you will get all the case solutions of the linear variation problem and they have this property that I mentioned, the separation theorem, each of them is an eigenfunction, is I upper bound to its own exact solution, corresponding exact solution. And uh, of course, if I increase, they all change values, they all become lower and lower. Huh? So entire content is what is basically given by the separation theorem. I think with that, we will leave the variation method. Now we are going to apply the variation method to the, to the derivation of the Hartree-Fock. Okay, Hartree-Fock equation. All right, so I think we'll close the class today. Mm -hmm.